Just a, a couple of additional words of uh, introduction to uh, Ian Yollis. Um, uh, Terry mentioned the Metropolitan Police. Uh, the police in this country, many of you will know, have a phrase, uh, somebody has form. So if you're a criminal and you have form, it means you've done the same thing, criminal thing, a number of times. Well, Ian has uh, form. Here's somebody who has worked with companies like Patagonia, uh, Body Shop, uh, Nike, and Now. So uh, there's a pattern there, and I think it's probably, on balance, a good one. But Now Recycle Bank. Ian, the floor is yours. Thank you, John. Um, let me just start by uh, maybe commenting on John's uh, comment about form. I, I'm from Canada, and maybe that's one of the reasons I've, throughout my life, made a habit of spending time in significant remote areas of wilderness, particularly in the mountains and paddling uh, very remote northern whitewater rivers. And I mention that because uh, when John mentioned earlier today that this room uh, was uh, built out of a single oak, my heart was sort of beating, and uh, I felt a great sense of reverence and humility um, when you mentioned that fact. And I think it's actually interesting that this conversation is taking place in this room, and particularly this part of the conversation, which is uh, focused on the idea of cities and scaling solutions in, in uh, significant urban environments, because my own personal experience, uh, I think, stems a lot from my interaction with wilderness and my sense, how it's informed my sense of place and purpose in the, role, in the world, but also um, it's, it's, it's where I feel the most connection to uh, one another, to humanity, to what it means to be here. So I think it's, it's great that we're having this conversation in this particular room. Um, Pamela set us off in the morning after John opened up the conversation uh, by talking about stories and storytelling. And embedded in these numbers is uh, a story. And it's a story of what I, what I think, keeping with the theme of the day, it's a story of breakdown and a particular system. And in this case, it's a story about the system of waste. And I'm using the United States as an example. So the first number is uh, the number of tons every year in the United States that are uh, of waste that's deposited in landfills. It works out, depending on who's counting, to about 4.5 pounds per person per day. The second number is the cost associated with that fact. And in fact, this is only part of the story because this cost is only the amount that cities spend on the tipping fees, the cost to put it in the landfill. It doesn't reflect the cost to get it to the landfill. And of course, the last uh, number is the other part of the story, which is not only are there significant material uh, economic impacts associated with this system that we've designed, that we've created, there are uh, equally significant and material environmental costs. New York, where I now live, sends its garbage to West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and South Carolina. Toronto, where I'm from, sends its garbage to uh, Michigan, to the state of Michigan. So this is a result, essentially, of a, of a linear system. We think in linear ways, we design linear systems. We typically have no idea where the products that we buy come from. We even have less idea where they go to. Now, I would argue that um, this system, which is something we've designed, is uh, the expression of a much sort of deeper ill, if you will. And it's embedded in the culture. In fact, it's embedded in the language and the way we speak. And the way we speak is important because our words inform how we think and ultimately inform our actions in the world and our behavior. Now, I don't know if anything strikes you as a little bit of odd, a little, strikes you as being odd about the juxtaposition of these two words and the fact that we talk about this, um, this process. Uh, we call it a waste stream. Um, I actually think it's not just odd, I think it's a little insidious because in the natural world, thinking of our oak here, there's no such thing as waste in nature. It doesn't exist. Everything's renewed, everything's regenerative. It's all part of an ongoing process of regeneration and recreation. So waste is, again, it's a, it's a human artifact. And to say waste stream suggests it's all a part of you know, a naturally occurring, somewhat benign process. So I think our language is a part of the, pro a part of the problem. Uh, because again, it informs how we think and how we act. Uh, so, if I think about the arc of the conversation today, we've, the conversation in part, you could say, has been about how one intervenes in complex systems to produce profound change. And Peter Senge, who you may, be, you may know, he's one of the leading theoreticians and practitioners when it comes to the art of intervening in complex systems to produce profound change. He's a professor at MIT. He would suggest if you want to intervene in a system, 
to pro produce profound change, let's think about waste as an example, you would be wise to start by asking yourself a question. And the question he would suggest you ask is, where in the system can I apply the least amount of pressure to produce the greatest amount of change? Where in the system can I apply the least amount of pressure to produce the most significant change? So Ron Gonan was the founder of Recycle Bank. He was a, a, a business student doing his uh, business degree at uh, the Columbia School in New York City. And he came up with his version of the answer. So the idea was to create value for cities by diverting waste from the landfill to the recycling stream. His answer to Sengi's question was a, a consumer-facing platform that actually incentivizes and rewards individuals and people living in household settings to uh, recycle more. And there was a little bit of innovation in terms of some technology that enabled uh, Ron and the early people at Recycle Bank to measure and track how much people were recycling and giving them points based on the amount that they recycled. And the points have a real economic uh, 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 value associated with them because the other part of the business model at the beginning when Ron was experimenting with this concept was that we would enter into local partnerships with businesses in the communities or cities that we deployed to. And those businesses recognized the points and you could use them to uh, purchase goods and services in your local stores at some sort of savings. So the idea was to incentivize people to do the right thing. So we've been working with the city of Philadelphia as an example, Mayor Nutter, and you can see the result. So waste has gone down, the city saves money because it costs the city money to put stuff in a landfill. Recycling rates have gone up. That represents new sources of revenue to the city because you can sell the recyclable materials on the commodity market. So there's savings and revenue being generated. There is uh, money going into the pockets of the citizens or the equivalent of money through the savings that they're generating. And finally, there's all of the associated benefits from a carbon reduction standpoint. So we now operate in about 300 different communities across the US and we've opened the business in the UK. But one of the things John was interested in exploring here today was the idea of scale. How do you take this early sort of entrepreneurial, innovative idea, we've sort of proved the model, we've demonstrated that the model works, how do you scale it? So one strategy in our case has been a new strategic partnership with a company called Waste Management. It's a $13 billion publicly traded company. They're in North America, the largest hauler of both waste and recyclable materials. So not only are they now an investor in Recycle Bank, but more importantly, uh, they have contractual relationships with 20 million households. So over the next several years, they're going to introduce Recycle Bank across their sort of installed base of communities across the country and perhaps into Canada. But there's one other dimension uh, talking about incumbents and tr the transformation of incumbents that's worth noting because there's a reciprocal dimension to this relationship. Historically, waste management has made its money by picking up garbage and shipping it and putting it in a hole in the ground. They know that that business model is not long for the world given everything we've talked about today. It is going to be obsolete. So they're in the process of transforming themselves, or they're attempting, in my view, to transform themselves from a waste, uh, a waste company to a resource recovery company. They've invested in about 30 early stage enterprises, Recycle Bank is one, who are focusing on taking waste and doing something to generate value. They estimate that the $12 billion of revenue they generate today by putting waste in a hole in the ground is actually ultimately worth $40 billion as you transition this idea from waste to resource recovery and using waste as a form of energy. One other example, uh, John mentioned the, the vision of the business has expanded. So if we think about behavior change and we started on waste, what about energy where we can work with utilities to where we can measure and track usage of energy in a household setting? What about water? What about transportation? What about general lifestyle uh, decisions that people make? So we're talking about cities, and it was referenced that half the world's population lives in cities. By, 2010, uh, by 2050, there'll be another 3 billion people living in cities. And so one of the really interesting things that's beginning to emerge is this concept called smart cities. And the basic idea is that city leaders traditionally, for decades and decades, millennia, have been focused primarily on thinking about the physical aspects of urbanity. So, the provision of interesting architecture and public spaces and the provision of utilities and so forth. 
Well, now I think there are some emerging examples of more enlightened city leaders who are beginning to think about how you can augment the investment in physical in infrastructure with new forms of digital infrastructure and data and software to build citizen engagement, to increase efficiencies, and ultimately to create smarter, cleaner cities. So John referenced it. Another very interesting example is right here in London. So TFL, the Transportation Authority, they want to reduce carbon. They want to enhance the quality of air. They want to reduce congestion in the city. They actually also want to increase the health and well-being of the people who live in London. So they have a number of strategies, but one is to increase the number of trips taken on a daily basis on either foot or by bike in, in London. And so they came up with this idea of sort of augmenting the existing investment in the physical infrastructure, the public bike lanes here in London, the existing public bike programs, with uh, this idea of, of, a, of a, a layer of digital infrastructure. And we just launched it a couple weeks ago. John referenced it. We call it Reroute. It's in the form of a smartphone GPS-enabled app that essentially helps people make choices about transportation in London, choices that relate to walking and biking. We reward them for doing that in the way that I described earlier. We have a number of businesses in London who are involved in the program. We give them feedback on their choices, carbon reduction associated with their individual trip, money saved, time saved. Uh, there's a whole sort of social uh, sharing part of, of, the, of the experience that we're building in. So we just launched it about two weeks ago. Uh, we've gotten some immediate sort of user feedback. We're hard at work on the next version of the app. It's going to be released sometime next week. So we'll continually enhance the experience over time. But I think it's a really interesting sort of microcosm, in a microcosm, an example of this concept of smart cities in using di digital infrastructure to enhance the already existing investment and considerable investment in physical infrastructure in cities. And so just to close, um, I think, again, coming back to this question of large-scale systems change, it's, it's always, I think another robust question um, is, okay, so if you want to change a system, it could be a small intervention, it could be a large intervention, well, what is your theory of change? What is my theory of change? How does the dynamics of change, how do the dynamics of change actually work? And I don't think there's any one answer, but I think in our case, the, the underlying theory of change does have to do with scale, but it's these two bookends. If we can engage uh, uh, citizen consumers at scale in a number of small incremental behaviors over time, all of which have a positive environmental benefit, then the theory of change is we can actually have at scale a material and positive impact on the world and also drive financial value as far as the business apparatus is concerned at Recycle Bank. So thank you very much.